All right, everybody, I'm back. I'm back, and it's uh, it's Labor Day. It's about two thirty in the afternoon. <clears throat> I'm in my office. I'm, I'm now. I'm on my OBS software, which I'm much more comfortable with. Um, so I'm I'm going to go over chapter fourteen for you, uh, and, and I'll make myself small here. And, get on here. Uh, I don't think I had any other... I'm going to see whether that... I, I just went over on WebEx, I just went over the homework on Chapter 13, and I'm hoping that I made a recording, and if I did, it would show up in here. Um, and you can see last week's class was recorded here. So if you, if you come into Cisco WebEx, you can see here's all of our uh, our meetings. I could start another WebEx meeting. I suppose I could record this um, on WebEx, but I'm going to record it on YouTube anyway. And um, what you do is is you go and here's past meetings like last week, and then here's recordings. And you can view this recording. You can actually go on here, just press copy there and view recording, and it'll come up of me doing class. I hope we're going to find out. See how good my connection is down here in uh, La La Land. Um, I'm down here in Rifle in my office, as I as I said in the so other day. Oh. Okay, there's so people. Quick and, That's and, good. And then, uh, so you can see this is pretty easy, and you can scroll through it and go where you want to go. And um, and, and uh, counting, thinking, oh, I just love everything to be figured out. Let's see how far see, I got. I, Ready? I don't, I don't like so that works pretty good. I, I, I'm. You know, I'm so impressed with this technology these days. Just despite my misgivings about COVID and everything else, I I really think we should be in person much better. But um, nevertheless, um, this is what we're doing. I'm one of those people who I I'm, I'll do anything just to be teaching, and hopefully, and and again, you know, I I want to get. A certain message out there that we're not doing, we're not teaching the way we ought to be, and, and uh, it's we're not teaching heterodoxy. We're teaching orthodoxy, and um, you can disagree with that. You can say, "Well, the, the orthodox method is the right method." Because, you know, it's sort of like <laughs> is that whenever I say uh, the the news headlines where where, where people are saying, "I, I don't want to see uh, critical race." theory in, in my classroom, I mean, it's really all over the news now. Um, the fear, what is critical race theory, all these things. I did a lot of study on it, but um, my point to that is, uh, or, or critical theories in general, you know, postmodernism is what it really amounts to. I, I would not put my child in a school where they were teaching that as a, as a pedagogy. I don't want to say present it as an, as an idea, but I don't want it to be pedagogical. In other words, the, the teaching method, the praxis of teaching. I don't want it to be that. And so um, there, that's, there's a big difference between that and uh, um, being against CRT or against any of that stuff. I'm not, I'm not necessarily against, I just don't think it it's a good idea um, as the only method of teaching. And I, um, anyway, it's just an interesting aside. All right, we are in uh, chapter 13. And I'm going to go right in the library and go to chapter 14 uh, and give a little bit of a lecture on, on 14 for you so that uh, we can keep moving in this, in this uh, holiday week. PowerPoint presentations, here's 14. So nice to be in a class with um, returning students because y'all pretty much know what you're doing. I, I, I mean, I'll keep trying to drill into you um, assets equal liabilities and owner's equity and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm, my wife is now texting me. I'm not going to say sorry, can't make it. They're going to Habitat. And I wanted to go because I love going to that place. Habitat for Humanity is like a used furniture 
deal. Uh, and uh, I, and I, I like looking at old, you know, other people's stuff. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. All right, chapter fourteen. Here we go. I'll, I'll show you these slides. They're, they're easier to see um, on, on, I don't know how WebEx really plays out, but, but it seems like on here, if I, if I do it in this sort of presentation method, I don't have a pen here in, uh, here in Rifle, so I can't write on it on the, on the, uh, on the board, so that, that makes it kind of eh. But nevertheless, uh, we can look at the, the notes down here, and, and they put, McGraw-Hill puts copious notes down in there, and they're supposed to help the professor. If I was in a, a you know, you can, you can put it in presentation form and read the notes. So, to me, I, I, I don't know, it's a little dry, but you might, you might find them useful. Um, chapter 14 only has 40 slides, so I'll get through it quickly. Uh, and it's about ethics of, of managerial accounting. Um, and it's, well, as you saw, uh, managerial accounting concepts and principles. Um, but there's, there's a whole bunch that goes into that. And, um, you're going to get, you're going to get this as you go through your BSBA or your, your business career like, all the time. Uh, so roles and ethics, um, manufacturing activities and the flow of manufacturing costs. Uh, d describe trends in managerial accounting, assess raw material inventories. Um, it's a, sort of an entrance way into uh, inventories of costing. I'm going to shut this. I have an air conditioner down here, and I don't really need it, but it's kind of noisy. So I thought I'd shut it off. Explain roles. Well, what are the roles? Managerial accounting provides financial and non-financial information to an organization's managers. Duh, right? We we you know we really figured this out last semester, and uh, um, it's it should be sort of in your brain already. But nonetheless, uh, th this whole course, one twenty one and one twenty two, two semesters, it, it's just sort of. Um, Redundant. It can, we keep saying the same, same things over and over, so so that we hope that you'll remember them and, and apply them in decision making. Uh, so accounting is is just part of strategic management. It's just part of decision making. It's about making order out of chaos. And every business is chaotic. So if you can make order out of it, you're going to do well. Um, the ethical piece. Uh, that we're about to get into is, is interesting. This is, manager kind of provides financial and uh, non-financial information to the organization's managers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and you all, you know, I, I hope you realize you're going to be managers. If, if you're, you know, this far in a, in a college career, you're probably likely going to be a manager. Um, so managerial accounting is for planning control. Are costs too high? Services profitable are are customers satisfied, right? Um, process of monitoring and evaluating, setting goals, planning, setting goals, and making plans to achieve them. We're going to hit our goals. And we're going to hit our numbers. You know, I could probably draw in here if I felt like it. Uh, but anyway, um, so it, again, we're back at you know we're in the second semester of accounting, but we're still we're still trying to nail down what the purpose of all this is and I, you should have it pretty much intuitively by now that that if, if you can make some order out of the chaos that is your business you're going to make better decisions uh, and, and you're going to you're going to play better with others if you know what you're you, you know if you have good information um, your your team is going to gel better if they know what the hell is going on uh, if you will. Um, that, that's the, the, the correct level of the collective, I think. Um, so the nature of managerial accounting, uh, we have users and, um, well, let's, let's look at this big because I can't see it that great from this slide. Boom. Um, managerial accounting differs from financial accounting uh, in, in the following ways. Users of accounting information, financial 
accounting information is provided primarily to external users, in, including investors, creditors, and regulators. Um, managerial accounting, right, <laughs> is, is the internal, right? And this just gives you the difference between these two. Uh, you know, what is the purpose of the information? You know, now it, it begs the question, if, if you're making one set of information for uh, um, managers and another set of information for uh, your lenders, is that ethical? Well, it depends. If, if, if some of the internal information is proprietary, meaning it belongs to the business and we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to let it leak out it, to our competitors. Yeah, then yeah, one, one of the problems with, with Bitcoin, with, with Bitcoin's version of a blockchain, uh, a blockchain styled uh, digital currency is that when you use it, everyone can see your ledger. The next person that breaks the, that, that breaks the hash can see, it would be as if, you wrote a check to your plumber and you went down and, and you and you he took it or she took your check and went to the bank to cash it. And they walked up to the teller and they said, I have a check here from Jim Cleaver. And the teller immediately showed you all of the transactions that I had made in the last six months. <laughs> and that's sort of the flaw in Bitcoin. You can see all of the transactions. You can see how that would be a problem. Uh, for competitors, you you don't want competitors to know who your maybe who your uh, uh, your vendors are, what the prices are you're getting, what 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 kind of contracts you've negotiated with vendors, you know things like that. So that's why managerial accounting would would be internal, you know, it would be and it would stay internal um, in some cases. Most of the time, uh, your competitors already know what's going on. I, that's my opinion. Um, but you, you know, you never know. Uh, now, how can I make this go forward? I think I just click on it. Okay, fraud and ethics. Uh, fraud is, we went through this in the first year, in the, in the first semester. Affects all businesses, costly. Uh, ACFE, I've read, they, they have their own journal and I've read some things about fraud that are interesting, um, you know. I. I think the bottom line of all of this is, are you, are you doing it? And, and, you know, do you have a system and, and are you, are you sticking to the system? Do you do, are you doing it? You know, period. And uh, the, here's four things, ensure reliable accounting, protect the asset, uphold company policies, promote efficient operations. Yes, of course. Uh, we all remember from last semester, uh, if, if you didn't, take the course out of this book, there's this thing called the fraud triangle, and it's got three sides, opportunity, rationalization, and financial pressure. Um, I think I, I make it a lot more personal. I, as, as a, a man of God, I consider myself, I want to know my employees well enough so that I can minimize this, right? I, I want to I be personal with people so they know who I am, and, and, and that's culture. What, what kind of culture are you maintaining in your and, and it doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, we only hire Catholics or something. You can't do that anyway. But it, supposedly that's illegal. Uh, but uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, you may ask somebody at at, a, at an interview if you could ask the question. You would say, "Yeah, you know, do you believe that there's a there's a uh, a morality that that comes from our culture? Do you think it's you know, how do you, how do you, where do you think your morality came from? You know, and I, I could give you biological origins. I could give you cultural or, origins such as churches and, and institutions. Um, ethics, of course, is what we practice within the company. Uh, so, uh, you know, it might be that, that uh, we, it, we constantly, uh, our ethical base might be based on this triangle. Um, or, or we may have a handbook, or we may have something else. But if you look at this triangle, uh, most of the time rationalization and financial pressure are due to the fact that I don't know my employees. You know, if I, if I know you and, and I know your kid is sick, um, we can 
we can pass the hat down on the factory floor and and get you some money to tide you over or i can make sure that you get aflac insurance and and so that you know you you, you have some insurance that covers you during a time like that when a family member is sick uh, or I could offer it myself to the company if I'm the owner. Um, you know, these, these are deeply moral things. And, and um, you know, some of them, they, I think they pay handsomely uh, in, in uh, employee loyalty, et cetera. So, but we're trying to uh, ensure reliable accounting. Well, how do we do that? Well, get down on the floor and, and look, uh, protect assets, put a lock on the door, you know, put a camera if you think you need one. Um, Institute of Management Account Accountants requires that management account accountants be competent, maintain confidentiality, act with integrity, communicate information in a fair and credible manner. Now, and, and that's all wildly subjective, uh, but you you know who a good person is, right? You, you you're aware of, of what how good people act, right? Uh, I would guess, you know, and and. Uh, that, that's that's very important. Now, career paths. This is this is quite interesting. Um, managerial accounting information is used in many careers. Here's some of them: CFO, controller, treasurer. Uh, you can you can look at this is sort of uh, the top tier in the red, uh, and and this is you know VP level, and then here mid and entry level staff accountant level, right? Uh, now, I, I think, you know, personally, I, I would take any one of you uh, as, as, a, as a staff accountant and train you from there. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't expect that you'd have to get any more accounting, uh, you know, courses, per se. Um, I think that, uh, you know, accounting well taught uh, is is quick. And, and it just, you know, from here on in, all the courses just to kind of add on to this basic course, which is good. Marketing staff needs sales and cost data, right? Management needs sales force de details. we got to work together. So if we know, you know, if we're all on a, on a retreat, everyone knows who's who's got the strong background in finance and who doesn't. And um, But you should have some background in this so you can so that you can get a seat at the table so that you can, even if you're in HR or you're in uh, uh, marketing or, or another division that's not so uh, finance laden, that's why you come and you take accounting anyway, because you're going to have part of a budget and, and you're going to um, add useful discussion to these, uh, you know, to these long-term discussion, these long-term strategic management decisions. All right. Accounting. Uh, concepts useful in classifying costs. Now we're going um, right into cost uh, from from that discussion of what is managerial accounting. Well, managerial accounting is is internal. Well, what's more internal than cost cutting? Um, and and our methods of keeping costs down may or may not be proprietary. You know, there might be lots of bicycle shops, but there's only one just like ours that, that uh, can reduce costs the way we do. Um, so the first idea we have is direct versus indirect costs. Direct costs are, are traceable to a cost object, one bike, one bike. You could look down here and you'd see it. You know, We could trace those costs, so the tire, the frame, right? Uh, indirect costs can't be cost effectively traced to a cost object. You know, that might be uh, accounting, administration, rent, manager salaries, right? Light and heat, that stuff. Direct materials. Um, costs are costs for direct materials that can be cost effectively traced through the manufacturing process to finished goods. So we get this idea of materials. What is it? I don't know. Tires, rubber, tire seats. They give you <laughs> tire seats, frame, pedals, brakes, cables, right? We could, those are direct. We know exactly where they're going. They're going on a bike. Uh, direct labor, wages and salaries for putting that thing together. Oh, yum. Um, example in a manufacturer of a bike, wages paid to bike assembly worker. That's direct. We, we, can, we can really, uh, we can look at that bike and go, it takes five hours to put that thing together, which is fun because you could say, how, you know, each employee is going to be a little bit different on putting that bike together. 
right? Some of you are going to be really good at that. You know, others, you know, we're, we're not all the same. That's a problem with the equity and equality people. We're not the same at doing anything. You know, some people are, I'm too slow to do taxes. How about that? <laughs> Ask Megan. I'm too slow. I just, I'm slow. I don't know why. I just, uh, I don't bounce from, you know, I, I can't bounce through people's uh, um, taxes really fast. Uh, and you have to do that in order to make money. Factory overhead consists of all manufacturing costs that are not direct materials or direct labor and cannot be cost effectively traced to finished goods. That's overhead. Indirect labor, that'd be like, you know, um, you know, if I'm pushing a broom on the factory floor after each shift, uh, that, that might be, or, or fixing the windows or you know, taking care of the building, putting new light bulbs in, you know, all that maintenance stuff. Uh, I have a good friend who does it for the hospital down here. It's a big job. Indirect materials, screws, nuts, staples, right? Ah, indirect, you know, oil, you, you know, lubricants. Indirect other costs, factory utilities. You know, keeping the lights on, keeping the lights on. Um, so now we have another concept. So we started out with this concept of uh, uh, um, direct and indirect costs, right? That was here, and now we're, now we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about prime and conversion, right? So these this is the the vocabulary that you gotta you gotta kind of get your get your head around. And I know I hate it. It's just more and more vocabulary all the time. I, I get it. Um, we have direct material, direct labor, and factory overhead. This is the conversion cost. Direct labor and factory overhead are conversion costs. Direct material and direct labor, prime cost. This is how they're combined. And it makes sense. I, I You know, if you're trying to get your head around it, try and think of putting a bicycle together. That's a great example. Um, so our manufacturing costs, direct labor, direct material, and factory overhead all go into the product, right? Um, period costs are non-production costs linked to a time period, not products. Selling expenses, right? Uh, you can think of sneakers if you like. Uh, um, you know, how much, how much does it cost to get Tiger Woods or whoever is the Nike person now to, the, you know, Selling expenses are cost to abstain orders and deliver finished goods to customers. That would be a selling cost. You know that. Uh, uh, well, I was going to use a bad word like jock. <laughs> you know that that athlete or or a, a famous person that you might use to advertise your product. Uh, that's a selling expense. G and A general and administrative expenses are costs of staff support and administration function. G and A you'll hear that over and over. Uh, hopefully you're already familiar with it. General and administrative uh, staff support. You know paper. <laughs> you know uh, uh, all this. Uh, let's let's look at product versus period. And and this is a good this is a good little chart to to get a get a grip on this. Product costs for a bicycle. Um, Right, with tires, seats, handlebars, frames, chains, brakes, you know, right. We, indirect costs, indirect and direct, right, for, for product. Factory accounting, rent, manager salary, light and heat, insurance. Right. Now, period costs here, advertising, promotional materials, office accounting, office employee wages. So that, this is a good slide to, to keep in your head or print out and and lay on the desk when you when you go to do your homework so you can you can try and you know I know my I, the homework will have some kind of uh, fill in the blank thing in it uh, that you have to do this with I'm pretty sure I put one in there I can't remember um, but office manager salary that's a period cost right but you can see you know immediately um, when I start farming in 86 the, the the price of milk is set by the government, so I cannot pass my costs. I if, if my costs increase, I can't pass it on to the customer. You know, it's it somewhat moves. You know, the 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 government tries to figure out 
how to price milk along with cost, but it's damn near, well, it is impossible. It's what we call the economic calculation problem. That's why central planning doesn't work. Um, all of your agricultural commodities, pretty much all of them are that way. You know, we, when you say we don't have a socialist country, we do. We do. The agriculture is completely socialized. Medicine is, uh, I don't know, 50% at least. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, I know how it works, uh, being on a board of a hospital. You know, uh, um, we set the price of, of, uh, of interest rate, you know, for banks. That is the basic price of everything. That's why you're seeing inflation. So, you know, and people say, oh, people say to me all the time, oh, we, we have to do these things because capitalism failed. I'm like, where? I'm, I'm looking at central planning that failed, right? When you mess around with agricultural products, you end up with surpluses, right? And we have caves filled with cheese because the government sets the price. But I was in a pickle because I, I, the government sets the price for my milk. So the only thing I can do is reduce costs, basically. You know, I'm 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 at the at the mercy of of a, like a pullet bureau that sets the price. We call it the Miscon the Milwaukee Wisconsin blend price, and there's a formula. And if you can understand milk pricing, you you can you can get a doctorate in economics. Um, it took me a long time to figure out what the hell kind of models they were using. It's crazy, but regardless of that, I still got to try and make money. So what can, what do I do? I I look at this very closely. I'm going to reduce cost as much as I can. So if I can get a, if I get a handle on cost, if I can use the this what I've been taught in accounting to as a framework, as a, as a rubric to use to try and reduce costs. What if I just printed out this slide, and I and I along with a couple other slides, and I put them down, and I just looked at what I was doing sitting at my desk. And I applied what I know about costing to it. Could I? Would it help me reduce costs? And in 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 my way of thinking, as as an accountant, I would say yes. This is how you. This is this is a framework or a method, an algorithm, right? That's why you take math, an algorithm to reducing costs and becoming more efficient, right? So that you know. <laughs> It's not just as simple as, well, we're going to pay less to, you know, pay our people less. No, there's all kinds of ways to cut costs and, and do things like that. And so product and period costs and financial statements. Look, look at how they play out here. Um, here's all of it. Year, year 2021 costs. Here's period costs, uh, expenses. Here's product costs, inventory, product costs, inventory. We have inventory sold, inventory not sold. The inventory not sold goes onto our balance sheet, right? As an asset. Assets equal liabilities and owner's equity. In our chart of account, inventory is an asset. Um, look that up. You know, if, you, if you need to refresh your memory on charts of accounts and things, make sure you look that stuff up. Uh, year 2021 income statement, we have selling expenses, right? Those are expenses. Remember over on the right-hand side, of, of the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. We would break down owner's equity into uh, di minus dividends plus revenue minus expenses, right? So selling expenses, G&A expenses, COGS, cost of goods sold. Right? Remember remember our, our gross profit was um, our sales minus our COGS gave us gross profits. And then we started subtracting expenses like overhead. So COGS, COGS of course, goes into your 2022 income statement, right? And to, to get going on the next, the next round of, you know, the next accounting cycle. So that's useful. Um, I, you know, in, in the idea of, okay, um, how am I going to classify, right? And remember a classified balance sheet or a classified uh, income statement, just broke it down further. How am I going to classify things in, in costing? And you can go nuts and, and classify stuff too much. You know, I've walked into places and gone, you're, you're too focused on costing. It's costing you money, which <laughs> sounds crazy. 
<laughs> but it's not, and you'll know. You'll know when you when you're, you you know you look at costing systems and and you think how you know how are we going to figure out how to reduce costs? Uh, we've got to do it effectively. Cost concepts concepts for service companies. Um, they're generally applicable, of course. Uh, they can classify costs as direct materials, direct labor, overhead, selling, or GNA. You know, if you're uh, a service company like my lawn mowing business, you know, you what what are your you you could break down my costs. You know, how much how like here would be a metric. How many gallons of gas per dollar of revenue? You know, per sales, right? How many gas per sales? That would be good. How could we reduce that? Get people to walk faster behind the mower. Get faster mowers if they're self-propelled. Right? You, you know what I mean? Uh, things like that. But you give up quality. Anybody who's ever cut a lawn said, you know, you go too fast. It's not going to look good. Right? Uh, so, all right. Now let's prepare an income statement and a balance sheet for a manufacturer uh, to try and figure out how this... Um, inventory and costing thing goes together. So look what we have. Now just think, if you, you all know what the, the accounting cycle is now, right? The accounting cycle involves stopping and measuring. So we got to stop. When we stop, if, you, if, if you're going to stop and measure on December 31st, and you're building something like cars or Dreamliners or, or you know, uh, uh, 757s or something. You're going to have one on the assembly line that's half done. Um, so you, you, we have to have a method of, of reporting on the balance sheet that, that reflects partially finished goods in a manufacturing company. Uh, so if you can imagine that, you know, even the bicycle, you know, you're going to have one that's you know, got no tires on it or whatever. So what we do is we, we start with this raw materials inventory. Um, these are materials that are waiting to be processed. You know, they're out in the warehouse. Um, we have a work and process inventory. This is partially complete products. Uh, some materials, labor and overhead have been added, right? And this is deeply the, the economic idea of when I mix my labor with with uh, good, you know, capital goods, get, I'm going to get a product. Well, when do we start accounting for that? Well, right away, right away. We start accounting for for mixing labor with with capital. Finished goods inventory. These are completed products. They're ready for sale. They're out in the warehouse. They haven't been sold yet. And here they are. Man, balance sheets for manufacturers, merchandisers, and services. And you can see what the difference is between the three. A service company, obviously, uh, um, no inventory. They may have inventory of, of like cleaning supplies or, or things like that, but we would call it supplies. We, we wouldn't call it, it would be an asset called supplies. We would take inventory at the end of the year to see how many, you know, how, mu how much, how many cleaning chemicals we have left, you know, to put on the balance sheet, right? When we, when we reconcile our, our supplies account with an actual account. But it's not the same as as a merchandising company that that has uh, like like Target that has all this crap on the shelves, right? That they that they got to count at you know once a year or whatever. They remember they use either perpetual or periodic inventory methodology, right? So perpetual is every time you go to the cash register, the inventory is updated. Periodic is we're, we're going to count once a year or once every six months or something like that. But eventually everyone does a manual count of the crap they got in their store. You got to, right? You got to figure out what you have for shrinkage. You know, Walmart does that. Um, okay. And then a manufacturing company, we've got this, this, this three section breakdown, raw materials, inventory, work in process and finished goods, right? And it's the same here, uh, Rocky Mountain bikes, bikes. The primary difference, of course, inventory, right? So reporting costs and, and the income statement, this is a great uh, um, graphic to look at. We have a beginning merchandise inventory for a merchandiser, and, and then we have 
cost of merchandise purchase minus ending inventory gives you cogs. Now here in, in the manufacturer, we have we have beginning cost of goods manufactured minus finished goods inventory cost of goods sold. Seems the same, right? Except look, right? Look at the difference here between uh, merchandises and manufacturing, right? Cost of goods available for sale, less finished goods inventory ending. Right? So um, pretty simple when you look at it. So explain these manufacturing activities and the flow of manufacturing costs. Um, again, I don't think I blocked anything there. Nope. Material activity. This is raw materials in, in your beginning inventory, right? And then we have these purchases, if you remember from all our inventory stuff. Production activity, work and process inventory, uh, direct materials used, direct labors used, and factory overhead used. The balance sheet gets this raw material inventory, ending work and process inventory, ending finished goods inventory. Right? They get all that. And the income statement gets COGS. Um, th this is sales activity of finished goods. Once we know what we sold, then we can, we, we, unsold goes back to the balance sheet, sold goes to the income statement. Right? Clear as mud, I think. You know, it's pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem simple probably two weeks into this next, this semester, but, you know, try and wrap your head around it. Uh, as you might see uh, the flow in this thing go. All right, now we're going to prepare a schedule of cost of goods manufactured, right? And uh, explain its purpose and links to the financial statement. So this is, I, I, th I think they they do this better than they've done in the past. <laughs> I like this, this method. The, the book, this edition, I think is simpler. Anyway. Schedule of costs of good good of a good manufacturer. Summarizes the type and amount of costs incurred in a company's manufacturing process. Type and amount, right? So we're trying to get a handle on our costs. We want to break it down into types and amounts. Um, direct materials plus direct labor plus factory overhead gives you the total manufacturing cost. Plus beginning work in process minus ending work in process gives you the cost of good manufactured. Okay? That's the equation. That's the one you got to remember to figure out the homework. All right? And here it is in, in, a, in a statement. Um, and I think I can do this. Let me do this like escape thing. And you can, you can look at these. It gives you compute direct materials used, compute direct labor used, compute factory overhead used, uh, and, and it goes there one by one. You can stop the tape and look that over. But we're going to sort of uh, beat it into you when you, when you uh, do the, the smart books and stuff. Um, so here's direct materials, direct labor, uh, factory overhead, and finally in the fourth cost of goods manufactured. So... Uh, and then we go to key calculations in schedule of cost of goods manufactured. This just tells you, you know, total manufacturing costs um, equals direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Cost of good manufacturing equals total manufacturer costs plus beginning and ending work inventory. This seems like Greek. It, it is. It gets, it gets, you know, as, as I said, you know, after these basic concepts are in your in, in your repertoire, so to speak, then, then it just gets more and more complicated. And you can go and take um, cost accounting, and it'll get deeper into this. Uh, to, to, but you're going to get enough of an overview to go, okay, I understand, you know, cost accounting. I understand that we've got to break down costs um, and do it this way. Right, so here's here's the cost flow across um, these accounting reports. In, in Rocky Mountain Bikes, we had a work in process ending of seventy five hundred dollars. Right, so um, you can see how that uh, how that was used. I I can't go back. Nope. Uh, yeah, I can. I can do that. <laughs> um, on my keyboard. 
So, right, if you look at this slide and then and then you look at this slide, it it sort of makes sense, right? Total manufacturing costs uh, plus beginning work in process and ending work in process. Um, total manufacturing, 175.5, uh, 2,500, 178,000 in process. Uh, at the, so the ending work in process was minus 7,500, gave you 170, okay? So 17500 you know, and then there's that 7500 that goes in finally into that um, balance sheet. And there it is on the income statement. Right? Kind of confusing, but, uh, you know, take it, if you, you stop the tape and back and forth it like I did. Um, all right, trends. The trend is your friend. Um, <laughs> I love seeing slides like this. Uh, the the future is unknowable. <laughs> All you uh, climate people out there, the future is unknowable. Um, you know, we we drive we drive by uh, uh, on the way to Alice's school. Um, one of those come on in, and we have a crystal ball, and we'll do tarot cards and figure out <laughs> what's going to happen in the future. And we we all laugh at that, you know, but when it's in business and somebody's got a model, we go, oh, no, 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 that's real. And you're like, nah, don't don't get married to your mathematical model. Um, but anyway, trends, trends in digital manufacturing, uh, customer orientation, e-commerce. Do you do you think uh, um, do you think that uh, Amazon's going to take over the world? Well, no, I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I think if if that was going to happen, Sears and Roebuck would be uh, not out of business, you know, because back then everybody had a Sears catalog and everybody had a telephone. So uh, e-commerce is fun and uh, Amazon's really cool, but uh, it it's a higher cost operation. I, I that's just logic. So uh, they exist on hot air right now. Mm service economy there's no such thing eventually we'll have to go back to manufacturing what we what we buy here at least in some part um you can't be a debtor nation we are we are currently a debtor nation um you know so we <laughs> we can't all just be servicing each other you know <laughs> serving one another that, that's not an economy consumption is not uh is not a product consumption is not a product um, although we think it is the joke about that is that, you know, there's five people on a desert Island and, you know, like, like lost <clears throat> and they, they start divvying up the work and, and, you know, it's people from other countries and, and, uh, uh, you know, one, one person goes out and gets coconuts. The other one goes and, and starts fishing and one of them makes a, uh, um, a, a lean to, you know, a shelter and the other one makes a cook fire and starts cooking and, uh, the, the fifth person is the American and they all sit down to eat and the American hasn't done anything. And, and, uh, uh, they all, they all later said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm an American. I, I consume, you need me without me. And none of this is useful. And, uh, he gets voted off the Island cause that's stupid. <laughs> so, um, think of that in terms of global, <laughs> you know, global politics, geopolitical kind of, uh, we, you can't be a, a consumer nation forever. You have to, you have to add to the day, to the game. The goal of lean business model is to eliminate waste while satisfying the customer and pri uh, providing a positive return. Um, I'm looking at my phone again. I apologize. Um, I think and remember where you heard there's another genius cleaver uh, thing that you can <laughs> you get what you pay for. <laughs> but I think that we're having a, a reassessment of lean principles, considering uh, the, the the tragedy of of the overreaction to COVID and and the ramifications on the supply chain. In other words, lean principles were. Um, we'll get all the parts we need for our car when we need them, and then we'll put the car together. 
uh, eliminate waste by satisfying the customer and providing a positive return to the company. Continuous improvement rejects the notion of good enough and challenges employees to managers to continually improve operations. Uh, some of these lean principles, uh, I, I think, are are going to be, you know, slightly modified. You know, just in time, uh, just in time manufacturing in particular, I think, is is going to uh, be looked at uh, very closely. You know, the companies that that were able to get chips, you know, now. Uh, are make, uh, there's a whole bunch of sales being lost in the automobile industry now. You know they're, they're losing sales. That's the thing you never ever want to do is lose sales. Have you ever been to the supermarket lately? Um, there's stuff that's not on the shelves, and I don't know why, but it's not. Uh, it's some kind of supply chain snafu. Uh, so. TQM, Total Quality Management, uh, you're going to hear about this in, in your strategic management class. Um, constant focus on higher standards, seek and uncover waste, quality improvement. I, I look at all these things and, I, you know, I'm a late, late in my life uh, business student and, and I'm, I, gotta I love academia. I love reading papers. I, I think I'm better read than most of my colleagues uh, just because I like it. Um, however... I think a lot of these buzzwords and phrases and, and systems that have been immortalized in textbooks uh, merely tell me that, well, they make me say things like, I don't care what kind of quality management system you have. Are you doing it? Do you, do, are, do you actually sit down? And if you're a manager uh, right now, as a matter of fact, um, are you sitting down and going, hey, what are we doing about quality improvement? Are we doing anything about it? Do we even talk about it? Uh, because most companies don't. Um, and, you know, some say they do. Uh, Enron was famous for that, you know, right before they went out of business and ripped off millions of people. So uh, seek and uncover waste. Well, of course, everybody wants to do that. You know, we don't want wasteful operations. Um, CMC is wildly wasteful. Uh, despite their, uh, their, their, uh, they, they have a problem. They don't have a profit motive. When there's no profit motive, you're wildly wasteful. That's why we have too many buildings, you know, and, and, uh, um, and we don't pay the teachers enough. And, and that's not a reflection on me. Um, I don't, I don't care. I do it for the love of it, but, uh, you know, we're not focused on the right things because, uh, it's hard to do TQM when you don't have a profit. That's that's the genius of free markets. You know, profits profits are what you need. They're they're not just a thing that you know people waste on themselves. They're they're a thing that that drive discovery, that drive choices, that drive uh, um, continual improvement. So TQM, it's a good good one to know. Good buzzword. Uh, good phrase to know. Um, just in time, I think I just mentioned, uh, I think there's going to be a serious uh, look at this as, as we get through these supply chain difficulties uh, that, that we're already having. Uh, so um, complete products just in time, receive customer orders, schedule production, receive materials just in time. That's, that's the deal. And, and you're seeing that uh, th this, this disruption in, in supply chains due to, due to this uh, disease that we handled poorly. Uh, that uh, you know, we we allowed the political class to shut down our our supply chains, and um, by the way, a lot of people are going to die because of that. Uh, a lot of people in poor countries, um, and I you know I've, I've been doing a lot of reading on this. I can't say it enough. You, you know, locking down and it is great for rich people. It's not great for poor people. Um, complete parts just in time for assembly. Let's see. So we're setting you up so you know these things. Value chain, this is, this is a subjective idea. Um, again, you know, what is a value chain? A series of principles that add value to the company's products. Uh, raw material, baking, sales, service. Service is, is uh, um, these principles uh, amongst them. How, how good is your service, you know? Well, what if, what if it's an airline? When, you know, when was the last time you had a great flight? And, and Nothing against again. It's not an ad hominem attack on your your aunt Matilda, who's a, 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 a flight attendant, or your uncle Jerry. Uh, in general, uh, flying is terrible these days. I think uh, maybe you don't. Um, 
So there's a value chain. And, you know, do, do we look at that? What's, what is our value? Is that a good metric or, or, or a good framework to use in order to make our company better? Um, this is the chapter that delves into some of these ideas that you're going to see over and over until you get to your capstone course uh, and, and you start to put all these things together. CSR, uh, this, this seems like everybody thinks CSR is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I don't know what this is. I don't know what it means. It's subjective. Um, it's, if you can't define something for me, I, I really I think it's silly. Um, corporations must consider demands of employees, suppliers, and society. When did they not? They've been doing that since day one. That's silly. Uh, corporate CSR goes beyond law. Oh, really? Okay. Triple bottom line. That, that's This is uh, a made-up thing. Uh, triple bottom line. I don't know what it means. Uh, uh, impacts how businesses report. You're going to see this more and more. So if you go to work for uh, KPMG or one of the big five or whatever, uh, they're using this as a marketing ploy to make more money, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, you might disagree. Um, corporations are, are uh, already socially responsible due to the laws that limit them from doing bad things. That's it. We have civil law that takes care of all this. Uh, I, uh, companies like Ben and Jerry's that put uh, their own ideology, this is an ideo ideological discussion, when they put their ideology first, uh, their investors run the other way. And that's what happened. That's why Ben and Jerry's went out of business. That's why they had to sell to Unilever. Uh, they were losing money. They weren't making money. They were losing money. Um, so, um, but I, I'm a man of God. So do the right thing. You, you know, I, I think that there's no such thing as a corporate social responsibility. There's individuals may, are responsible for the, for the things that they do. It's just, it's just a difference between individualism and collectivism. I'm not a collectivist. I look at the the bloody 20th century as the result of collectivization, as a result of collectivist ideas, whether they be national socialism or or uh, or communism, one or the other. I think they're bad ideas that that uh, end up in murder. Uh, you're allowed to disagree with me, and and I, I so this this push towards whatever is cor corporate social responsibility is supposed to mean that if I'm a, a corporate CEO. I should care about your political problem, and I don't. So uh, I care about my own soul. <laughs> we can talk about that at length in class if you'd like, uh, and you can tell me how wrong I am. Um, that's why we teach in a heterodox uh, manner. So uh, CSR. So um, A1, raw materials inventory management using uh, raw materials inventory turnover and day sales. You know, this is just another another tool to put in your toolbox to uh, look at efficiency in, in your operation. So how much raw materials are you using? Are they going bad? You know, I mean, are, are you using them fast enough? Um, beginning inventory, ending inventory divided by two. Uh, and then we take uh, the turnover. We, we, uh, we take raw materials used divided by uh, the ending, the beginning and ending inventory divided by two. So there it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so 10.1, is that a good number? Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, depending on what business you're in and, and what you're doing. And then days sales in raw materials. So how long is the, are those raw material inventories sitting out in the yard? That's the question. And here's the Here's the uh, equation that you'll need. Now that wraps up chapter 14. Um, so I'm going to put this up tonight so that you have it. And hopefully my WebEx one with the, uh, with, with the, the solutions of chapter 13, you know, the check figures so you can go over it. And I, I, I didn't really go over the problems in depth as much as I just to show you the problems. And, uh, see if you know if you're stuck somewhere you can you can go to the videotape um, so anyhow that's what I've got for today happy Labor Day I hope you're taking it easy and I will see you all next Monday any questions of course look me up find me uh, text call 
uh, email and I'll make a little tape. But, uh, you know, I can go through problems with you or whatever you need to do. Okay. Thanks for watching.